Hello, everybody. Welcome to Connections. Appreciate you joining us today. We know that we got word that there will be several people joining us today. We have friends from Woodland Park and Wisconsin and down south and all over. Glory to God. And we have people even from the Philippines that watch us. So hello to all of our good sisters out that way. Praise God. We are a global, we're an international ministry. Hallelujah. Right here. This is awesome. We're so thankful for this type of technology and the good things that the Lord is doing. So welcome. For those of you that have been joining us on Sunday mornings, you know that we usually take and open our Bibles to Psalm 91 and read that out loud. But we're not going to be doing that today or nor next Sunday because we want to give the Holy Spirit plenty of time to minister and uh, just to do what he wants to do in our lives. So thank you for joining us. Having your Bibles this morning, let's open them please to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to talk to you today and next Sunday about the ministry of a prophet. And I believe that this word will be a blessing to you and help you and put you in a position where you can help others. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read verses 7 through 14. Praise God. Come on in, get a seat. There's a couple up here on the front row, guys. Ephesians 4, 7 through 14. And we've got chairs over there too. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. And people are logging on. Glory to God. You're going to get us a good group of people today. Are you ready? Here we go. Ephesians 4, 7. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts, plural, unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, everybody please say some, some. some. and some prophets, some, some. some. and some, some. Evan evangelists and some. Some. some pastors and teachers. Some doesn't mean all, does it? It just means some. <laughs> for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby we, they lie in wait to deceive. Jesus, the resurrected Lord Jesus, gave us the fivefold ministry to perfect the church. This includes the office or the ministry of the prophet. Jesus gave us prophets for the perfecting of the church. The ministry of the prophet is still in existence today. But there is probably more misunderstandings about the office of a prophet than anyone else or anything else. Jesus is the head of the church. I'll take an amen right there. Amen. Jesus is the head of the church, and from our resurrected Lord comes the ministry gifts. And I read uh, verses 7 through 10 before we, re we read verse 11 and 12, because I wanted you to see the context that the resurrected <clears throat> Jesus, he gave the ministry gifts. The ministry gifts do not consist in name only, but in power. A power to accomplish something. If you have to keep advertising who you are <laughs> and what you are, you probably don't have much. It shows a real lack of insecurity when you go around giving off your title to everybody. I had a great experience. I was 27 years of age. We had moved to Arkansas and there was a church that I was checking out to see if we were supposed to go there. And they had a midweek prayer meeting. And I thought, well, I'm going to go to their prayer meeting and check it out and kind of gauge the church by the type of prayer meeting they have. So I walked into this church, didn't nobody, nobody knew me, 
went in, sat down, and prayer service had already begun. I, I on purpose came about five minutes late. People are walking around, people are kneeling, just people all over the place. Pretty decent sized church, and there were people praying. So I went, sat down, didn't say anything to anybody. And I have my Bible and my head's bowed and I'm praying, seeking the Lord. And then I, I, I lift my head up and I notice that there are three women at the front of the church and they're pointing at me. And they're talking and they're pointing at me. And I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Since I don't know anybody, nobody knows me. It's my first time to be here and these ladies are pointing at me. So I kept praying and I looked up again and they're still talking about me and pointing at me. So I thought, well, Lord, I don't know what's happening here, but uh, we'll just keep seeking you. A little bit later, a lady came up to me. She left the group, and she came up to me. She said, excuse me. She said, we've been talking about you. And I said, I noticed. <laughs> she said, you're a minister of the gospel, aren't you? I said, well, yes, I am. She said, in fact, you've been pastoring. You just finished pastoring a church, didn't you? I said, yes, ma'am, that's true. And I said, well, why would you say that to me? She said, well, it's just all over you. It's just real obvious you're a pastor or a minister and that you're in the ministry. The anointing's all over you. And that's happened to me about three or four times in my life in different locations. If you have to keep advertising who you are, you probably don't have much. The Bible says that a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great people. So what God has called you to do, his gifts, his anointing upon your life, is going to manifest itself and people are going to come to you and tell you who you are and what you are as confirmation. So I thought that was a real great experience and was appreciated the Lord giving me that. But once again, if you have to advertise who you are all the time and give out your titles, you probably don't have much. I heard someone make, make this statement one time I thought was awesome. They said, you could sit in a, in a garage and call yourself a car all day long, won't make you one. <laughs> and you can call yourself a prophet all day long, won't make you one. You can call yourself a pastor all day long, won't make you one. Either you have the goods or you don't. Now, there needs to be training, of course, but... Once the resurrected Lord Jesus calls you into the ministry and he gifts you, those gifts are going to manifest themselves. So once again, the ministry gifts do not consist in name, but in power. It just shows up. So Jesus gave us the ministry gifts and he gave us the ministry of the, of the prophet that the church would be perfected. Let's read please in the book of John chapter 3 and verse 34. Many people today think that the ministry of the prophet doesn't exist anymore, but that's not true. The ministry of the apostle and the prophet does exist. Most people are more familiar with the evangelist and the pastor and the teacher. John chapter 3 and verse number 34 gives us a statement about our Lord. John 3, 34 Scripture says, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Now, one more time, that verse may not be too familiar to you. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Jesus understands the ministry because he operated in fullness of every gift. You see, Jesus had the Spirit without measure. That means he had the fullness of the anointing. Everybody else has a measure of the anointing, okay? But Jesus had the fullness. He had, it, he had the Spirit without measure. So he had the anointing in fullness. We, from that, we get this. Jesus is in a class by himself in each ministry gift, okay? Okay? Jesus is in a class by himself in each ministry gift. Jesus operated as an apostle fully and completely. He operated as a prophet fully and completely. Evangelist, pastor, teacher, he had the fullness of each office upon him. And so when he was resurrected, he distributed his anointing and his giftings to the body of Christ. I'm going to make what I feel is a very important statement, and if you don't agree with this, you probably won't agree with the rest of the message. Jesus is the pattern we are to follow in ministry. I believe that Jesus is the pattern son, and he's the pattern. He's the example for all of life, 
If we need an example, we can follow Jesus. He's a perfect example for us. At, well, I don't care what, what you're talking about. Jesus is the pattern son. And especially in ministry, Jesus is the pattern that we are to follow. Amen. Thank you. I needed that. Praise the Lord. Somebody give her some money. <laughs> <laughs> would you all agree with that, that Jesus is the pattern son? Yes. You would? Okay. Praise God. Everybody, not just one lady. I appreciate that. Okay, we're talking about the ministry of the prophet. Jesus had the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He operated completely in the anointing. Let's go to Matthew 13. Jesus called himself a prophet. Matthew 13, verses 57 and 58. I think if Jesus is our pattern, if he's our example, we're going to be safe. Now, there are other ministries that we can pattern off of out of the Bible, but I think Jesus is the best one. Matthew chapter 13, verses 57 and 58. Thank you for watching today, for logging in. There's more people coming on. Glory to God. There's Sister Ashley. Good morning, sister. Matthew 13, verse 57. And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So we see from here that Jesus called himself a prophet. No one else will ever stand in the highest class of a prophet because Jesus had the spirit without measure. I want to say it to you a little bit different. Jesus had a degree of anointing upon him as a prophet that no one else will ever have. He is the pattern the modern day prophets should copy. Jesus is the pattern the modern-day prophets should copy. Now, I want to make one other statement here that is so vital, and I think this is going to give us a good direction and give us some good uh, revelation here. You all agree with me that Jesus is the head of the church, right? Yes. Okay, and all the ministry gifts came from him, right? Yes. Jesus' plan for the church under the new covenant are different than his dealings with Israel under the Old Covenant. Some of you are beginning to think that's really good. Jesus' plan for the church under the New Covenant are different than his dealings with Israel under the Old Covenant. If we do not know this, our theology is going to be so messed up, our belief system is going to be wrong, and we're going to be seeking after things that we shouldn't be seeking after. One more time, Jesus' plan for the church under the new covenant are different than his dealings with Israel under the old covenant. And I wanted to look at three different verses of scripture to, to begin to elaborate on this. Let's go to Exodus 13. Exodus 13, 21 and 22. Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. Hallelujah. For those of you that are watching by Facebook, we have people in the room that are beginners and they're going through their Bible, finding Exodus. Others have been around and they turn right to it. That's a blessing to see people opening up their Bibles and reading along. Exodus 13, 21 and 22. The way Jesus deals with the church is different than the way he dealt with Israel. His plans are different, and the way he deals with us is different. In Exodus 13, 21 and 22, just giving people their chance, don't want people to be discouraged that they just get there and I'm already three scriptures away from them. <laughs> Verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire, to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Wouldn't that have been amazing to see this huge pillar that's just a fire? And if you study this out, when the cloud moved or when the, the pillar of fire moved, then the children of Israel, 
gathered up all their belongings, packed up their tent, and they would follow the cloud or they would follow the pillar of fire. So he led them by the way with this pillar of fire and with this cloud. And he didn't, he didn't take it away from them. That was so spectacular to see something like that. It had to be amazing just to open up your tent door and there's this huge, huge cloud, this, this pillar of fire. You know, and, and at night, it gave off light. So for those that were afraid to sleep at night, there was your night light. It was a, this, <laughs> this pillar of fire it had been awesome. Hallelujah. All right. With that in mind, Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14, verses 1 through 3. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> I could tell you page 1045, but it probably wouldn't do you much good, would it? Don't have the same kind of Bible I do. Exodus, Exodus, Ezekiel, <laughs> Ezekiel 14, the first three verses. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? All right. Stay patient with me here. Let's go to Romans. Romans 8, 14. Romans 8, 14. Jesus' plan and his ways for the church under the new covenant are different than his different than his dealings were with Israel under the old covenant. Romans 8 14. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody say revelation, revelation. is coming my way. Is coming my way. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. God had to lead Israel by the, the pillar of fire. He had to lead them by the cloud under the old covenant because the people were not born again. God could not deal with them in the spirit because they were spiritually dead. Under the new covenant, because of the new birth and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, God can and does deal with us, and he does lead us by his Spirit. Under the old covenant, God dealt with Israel in a spectacular way. He did it visibly for all to see. Under the new covenant, he leads us not externally, but internally. It's not... It's not, um, how do I say that, Lord? It's not as spectacular, but it's just as supernatural. And many times, baby Christians will pray asking God for something spectacular when they're missing the supernatural. That cloud, that pillar of fire was supernatural. It's just as supernatural to be led by the Holy Spirit living on the, on the inside of you. It's not as spectacular. God had to deal with them because they were not born again. He deals with us. He leads us internally because of the new birth. There is a difference between the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet. Thank you, Lord. You're already talking and dealing with people and people are thinking. There is a difference between the Old Testament prophet and the New Te Testament prophet. And that is where many people miss it today. They try to give the New Testament prophet the same status as the Old Testament prophet, and he doesn't have the same status. For example, the Old Testament prophet was the only ministry in operation from the standpoint of preaching or teaching the people by inspired utterance. Today, we have the fivefold ministry. We have the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and teacher. 
So there is a difference. The priests under the Old Testament, they were anointed by the Holy Spirit to teach the law and precepts about carrying out the sacrificial sacrifice, all right, the sacrificial system. But the prophets were the only preachers. They were the ones that the Spirit of God would come upon and they would preach and teach the people. The king was anointed for governmental issues. The priests were anointed for the sacrificial system. But the prophets were only were, were really just the only pastors, not pastors, but preachers and teachers. The Spirit of God would come upon them. Under the Old Testament, people would go to the prophet to inquire, what is the Lord saying to us? They had to go to a prophet because they were spiritually dead. Here's another example. Under the Old Covenant, the prophet gave guidance to the people. So the people had to go to them to find out what God was saying. In the New Covenant, every believer can hear from God for himself. Yes. Somebody should have said, thank you, Jesus, right there. Thank you. In the New Covenant, every believer can hear from God for himself. Therefore, under the New Covenant, it is unscriptural to seek guidance through a prophet. Wow. If we were living under the old, you had to go to a prophet because we couldn't hear from God. This is why it's a better covenant. Jesus has died. He's rose again. The new birth is available. And for every child of God, we have the privilege of hearing from God for ourselves. We don't need to go to a man. It's unscriptural in the New Testament to go to a prophet to seek guidance. Prophets today do not lead, guide, or direct people's lives. Directing the lives of others is nothing more than fortune-telling. Thank you, Lord. Aren't you glad you have a Bible? Amen. And the Holy Ghost. Amen. Every believer has the Holy Spirit in him to lead and guide him. We can hear from God for ourselves. To follow after prophets is spiritual immaturity. To follow after prophets is spiritual immaturity. Praise the Lord. I believe in the prophet. We're going to get to that. <laughs> so the question is, okay, if the, if the status of the New Testament prophet is different than the Old Testament prophet, and it's a whole lot less, then what is a New Testament prophet? Well, since Jesus is the pattern of what a prophet is supposed to be, Let's look at him. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Let's find out what a New Testament prophet is supposed to be. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. We have it so much better that we can hear from God for ourselves. We don't have to go to a man and say, would you tell me what God is saying about my life? A lot of people have been goofed up because they've gone to someone for help when they should have went to the Lord. And you know, here's another thing. God loves you so much, he wants to speak to you. He wants to reveal his will to you. Hallelujah. Um, I, this is not in my notes. It just came to me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you. God wants a relationship with you, and he wants to speak to you. It would be terrible if I had my friend, and I go to my friend, and say, would you do me a favor? Would you go kiss my wife for me and give her a hug and tell her I love her? That would be so inappropriate. I want a relationship with my wife. She wants a relationship with me. I don't need somebody going and telling my wife I love her. I can do that on my own. The Lord is our husband. We, his church, are his bride, and he wants to kiss us on the cheek, and he wants to reveal his will for us. And he wants to tell us he loves us. Hallelujah. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Even as a prophet, Jesus' ministry consisted first of teaching, second preaching, and third healing. Say that again. Even as a prophet, Jesus' ministry consisted first of teaching, second preaching, and then third healing. A prophet's primary purpose and main ministry is to preach or teach the Word of God. 
this is a New Testament prophet right here. A prophet's primary purpose and main ministry is to preach or teach the word of God. Prophesying is not the main thrust of the prophet's ministry. Prophesying is not the main thrust of the prophet's ministry. Preaching and teaching is what matures the saints and equips them for service. Remember Ephesians 4? Why, does, why did God give us the fivefold ministry? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service. A prophet is supposed to teach and preach the word first, not prophesy. It's preaching and teaching that gives us what we need to mature us and make us able to do the ministry. Is the prophet supposed to prophesy? Absolutely he is. But it's not his main ministry. Now, I said and I maintain that Jesus is the best example. He's the pattern in all things. Let's turn to a scripture and look at Jesus operate in his prophetic ministry by going to John 4. Here is Jesus operating as a prophet. John chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. John chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. Jesus is ministering as a prophet. A lot of great insight here. <clears throat> Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that sayest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> All right. In the prophet's ministry, the revelation gifts operate more frequently than in the believer's life. You know what the revelation gifts are? The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and discerning of spirits. Those three gifts are the revelational gifts. Jesus operated here as a prophet, and he had a word of knowledge. You've had five husbands. The guy you're shacking up with now was not your husband. You, you didn't lie to me. You told me the truth that you have no husband. The only way he could have known that was by a gift of the Spirit known as the word of knowledge. A prophet, this gift, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and, rev and discerning of spirits operates through the prophet more than a what you might call the laity or a regular believer. Now, I want you to notice two very important things here about this scenario that reveals a lot to us about a New Testament prophet. Number one, Jesus saw and he knew things supernaturally. However, in Jesus' prophetic ministry, Jesus did not go around prophesying to everyone he met. He didn't have a word for everybody. And if anybody could have a word for everybody, it would be Jesus. He's the Son of God. And he operated at, in a prophet's ministry, prophet's anointing, in fullness. But Jesus did not go around getting everybody, I got a word for you, I got a word for you, I got a word for you, come here, I got a word for you. He did not do that in his ministry as a prophet. That is an abuse. Okay? Number two, a prophet operates more in the prophetic in a private setting than in a public one. Now, I'm not saying a prophet can't have a word in a public setting, but if you study the ministry of Jesus, study his prophet's ministry, you will notice that he operated as a prophet in a private setting. It's never once showed that he did it in a public setting. Okay? If you don't believe that, Luke 5.22 and John 1.47. We're not going to turn there, but for those of you taking notes, Luke 5.22 and John 1.47. You'll notice this in the ministry of, of Paul, because Paul was a prophet and a teacher years before he was an apostle. And you'll notice that he had words for people privately, not publicly. The apostle Paul was a prophet. He did not go around giving words and having words for people. John the Baptist was a prophet, and not once is it written that he went around giving people a prophetic word. To stay on course in his life and ministry, a prophet must always make sure He's basing his ministry on the word and not spiritual gifts. 
Anybody who bases their life or their ministry on spiritual gifts is going to wind up on a junkie. They're going to wind up hurt, and they're going to wind up hurting a whole lot of other people. Putting prophecy before the word is wrong, and it is dangerous. Putting prophecy before the word is wrong, and it is dangerous. And I want to, I'd like for us to read to show you something about prophecy. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Second Peter chapter 1, 16 through 21. This is a powerful, powerful passage of Scripture. If you find 1 Peter, you're real close. <clears throat> a prophet is never to put the spiritual gifts before the Word of God. <clears throat> For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. <clears throat> they were what? Eyewitnesses of what? <clears throat> of his majesty. Okay. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So this is Peter talking about the, the, talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John was with Jesus. They're on the mountain. Jesus transfigured before them. They saw him in his glory. They heard the audible voice of God. God their Father spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. How many of you know that would be spectacular? That would be pretty dramatic. Then he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. <clears throat> Here it is. The written word of God is more sure than seeing Jesus transfigured and hearing the audible voice of God, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We need a revelation <clears throat> that this is the more sure word of prophecy. The majority of Christians do not believe that we have a perfect Bible. They believe that there are things missing, things are missing in translation, and yet Peter says we have a more sure word than hearing, G hearing the audible voice of God and seeing Jesus transfigured. We need a revelation that this is a more sure word. <clears throat> Any spiritual experience you might have has to submit itself and be judged in the light of the written word of God. Didn't Paul say in Galatians, if an angel would come and preach any other gospel, let him be accursed? Right? I have in my heart, I'm troubled about something. I've been watching what is, they call themselves prophets. And I'm not saying that they are or they're not. I don't know. But I've watched four or five programs now where they're being interviewed. And it bothers me that they come on the platform or they come on stage, whatever, they're being interviewed, and there's not a Bible on the table. When they sit on chairs and to minister to the congregation, and they're going to have words for people, they don't have a Bible. If I was going to minister, knowing it was being recorded, I was going to go to where a bunch of people are at, and I'm going to be a spokesman for God, I am not leaving my Bible at home. Anybody yeah. want to say amen to that? It troubles me. For people to keep saying, I'm a prophet, I'm a prophet, I'm a prophet, and they don't have a Bible in the room. That really bothers me. I'm not saying they're not one. I'm just saying I'm troubled by this repeatedly having these people come 
being interviewed, I got a word for you, I got a word for you, and there's no Bible in the room. This is the more sure word of prophecy right here. <clears throat> I believe in prophecy. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. But if you base your ministry on the gifts, you're going to wind up abusing it. And what you're going to do is you're going to have people go, oh, let's go hear the prophet. Let's go hear the prophet. Let's go hear the prophet. That is immaturity, and what you're saying is God will speak to them first and foremost before he will speak to me. I trust what God has to say through them, but I don't trust for God to speak to me. We need to grow up past that. A prophet should prophesy, but he should preach and teach the word of God first and foremost. Praise the Lord. We're about to close here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There was something else that has been said that is troubling me. That is showing that we're getting abuse. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is, the, this is our last passage of scripture, I believe. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. <clears throat> one of these guys who claims to be a prophet, he said this on more than one occasion. He said, the Lord Jesus told him to tell us to teach your kids how to prophesy. Okay, he said that more than once. Teach your kids how to prophesy. It's so important that you teach your kids how to prophesy. Teach one another how to prophesy. <clears throat> well, let's see if that's scripture or not. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one in the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. You cannot teach your kids to prophesy. <clears throat> if you teach your kids how to prophesy, then we don't need the Holy Spirit. Prophecy is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You can teach someone how to read their Bible. You can teach somebody how to study. You can teach somebody how to meditate the Word. You can teach somebody how to pray to a certain extent. But if, if I can teach you how to prophesy, we don't need the Holy Spirit. We're now operating the gifts apart from the Holy Spirit. That's, that's abuse. That is not right at all. Prophecy is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You can't teach somebody how to pray in tongues. Can't do it. You can't teach somebody how to pray in tongues. It is a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. None of these gifts you can teach somebody else. It is the Holy Spirit as he wills manifesting himself and he will teach you how to prophesy. He will teach you how. The Bible says that we prophesy according to our faith. Now what that means is the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he uses your measure of faith to prophesy. So however much word you have in you, however much faith you have in you, that's how he can express to that extent the Holy Spirit can manifest the gift of prophecy. That's why a baby Christian can operate in the gifts because he's not operating in the gifts. The gifts are operating in him. Okay? I don't like this phraseology while well, I'm operating in the gifts. No, the gifts are operating in you because the Holy Spirit's manifesting himself. It doesn't require an education to be used of the Holy Spirit. It takes a willing heart. Amen. Amen. This is why a baby Christian can prophesy, but his messages tend to be short and simple because he doesn't have his faith matured. He doesn't have a lot of word in him. You take somebody who's been in the word for 45, 50 years, the Holy Spirit has something to work with. He's got more scriptures, more faith to manifest that gift. The gifts of the Spirit, the manifestations of the Spirit, are perfect. The Holy Spirit's perfect. The gifts of the Spirit are perfect. But they're manifested through imperfect beings. So that's why we have to judge through the Scriptures what's being manifested. Because we're not perfect. I'm not perfect, neither are you. The more we yield, the more we learn, the better the, and the purer that flow and the greater the manifestation. 
but they still have to be judged with the word because what's perfect is coming through something that's imperfect. That's why I'm not here to call names. I'm not here to knock anybody down. We're all growing and developing. I've made mistakes in this area. I'm learning. I'm growing. And so we got to give each other grace. But at the same time, we need to present from the Bible what is an Old Testament prophet, what's a New Testament prophet. There is a difference, and we need to be mature enough to know that difference, and we need to be mature enough not to chase after a prophet when we can hear from God for ourselves. Amen. Baby Christians seek after the spectacular. We need to start seeking after the supernatural. The Holy Spirit whispering in your heart, call Joe. Call Joe. It's just as supernatural as a flame of fire. Hallelujah. Let's grow up, not look for the spectacular because that's the devil's realm. He can give you all kinds of shiny lights. Okay? Don't pray. I want to hear an audible voice. <laughs> a pastor I had, he was praying. He was a baby Christian, like three months old. He got candles. He filled his bathtub full of water, put some suds in there. He got candles. And so he got the bathtub. He said, oh, I want to hear. Oh, I want to hear an audible voice. Oh, you know. And the devil speaks to him and says, pray to me. I'll, I'll talk to you. He goes, ah, I got that bathtub. Blew off those candles. I don't want that kind of talk. <laughs> How, he's a baby Christian. He was sincere. The devil was willing to accommodate him. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is part one. We'll do part two next week and look at some other things concerning the ministry of the prophet. Hallelujah. Thank God for prophets, but their main task is to teach and preach, not to prophesy. If you go to a meeting and a prophet has a word for everybody, uh, probably not. Because it's just not in the word of God. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We appreciate it. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. as we have a brand new series for you. You're going to like this. It's about, well, you just have to wait and see. We love you guys. We'll see you tomorrow.